Gazing at the night sky and its spectacular collage of stars, planets, comets, and our own Milky Way galaxy is as old as humanity itself. The telescope was invented in the early 17th century, ultimately leading to new understandings of our place in the cosmos. Stars in the night sky helped sailors navigate our oceans and gave rise to our wondering if we're alone in the universe. But with the invention of the light bulb in the 19th century, the stars became more difficult to see and everything began to change. In recent decades, astronomers have expressed growing concern about the light pollution and ubiquity of electric lights the world over. Brightly lit urban centers and suburban sprawl obscure the night sky, not only impacting scientific research in the field of astronomy, but also blotting out the spectacular beauty of our cosmological neighborhood and breaking our connection with the universe around us. More recently, a new threat has emerged, a threat that could permanently close the door to the night sky and further isolate humanity from our stellar surroundings and indeed our stellar origins. That threat is the overcrowding of low Earth orbit with human-made objects and the increasing deployment of satellite constellations for communications purposes. Tonight, we invite to the SETI talk stage an astronomer, an engineer, and an entrepreneur to offer their perspectives on this hotly debated topic and explore whether any common ground can be found between our conflicting priorities. Our guests will be introduced this evening by Simon Steele, Deputy Director of the Carl Sagan Center for Research here at the SETI Institute, a galaxy astronomer in his own right, and the moderator for tonight's discussion. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and SETI Institute friends the world over. Thanks for joining us for tonight's SETI talk, Satellite Constellations, an Existential Threat for Astronomy? Question mark. My name is Bill Diamond, President and CEO of the SETI Institute. For our regular SETI Talks attendees and new guests joining us via Zoom tonight, let me remind you that you can post questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to address as many as we can at the end of the panel discussion. Please do be patient with us. It's tough to answer all the questions that come in, but again, we'll do our, our utmost. I also wanna remind you that we love to know where you're joining us from. So please use the chat function to tell us where on earth you are and whether in fact you're in a dark sky region with access to the night sky. I'd also be interested to actually know how many of you have seen with your naked eyes standing here on earth, the Milky Way galaxy. Our SETI Talks lecture series is a production of the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California, and it's made possible by the generous support of people like you. Learn how you can get involved in our mission, support our work, or sign up for our weekly newsletter journey online at SETI.org. Tonight's talk is sponsored by the many donors and friends of the Institute who fund our outreach programs through their generous gifts. The gift to us is a gift for all of you, and we're grateful for their support. If you'd like to personally sponsor a SETI talk or learn more about how to support our work, visit us at SETI.org or contact us by email at info at SETI.org. So before turning the podium over to Simon, let me remind you to check the events calendar on our website for information about upcoming SETI talks and other outreach programs of the Institute. And with that, it's time to get things underway. So as Captain James T. Kirk famously said, Mr. Steele, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. That's a great introduction. And, and thank you, everyone, that already posting where you're viewing in from. And we'll we'll read out some of those uh, a little bit later. Um, of course, this, this subject is dear to the heart of the SETI Institute. Uh, the, the way that the SETI Institute searches for intelligent life in the universe is twofold. They're, they're using the radio region of the electromagnetic spectrum and using the optical region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And both of these are, are have a big um, uh, investment in what's going to happen in the future of constellation satellites and, and the population of low Earth orbit. So although we're not directly talking about the search for aliens at the moment, this is going to have a big impact on, on how that is this is done and how we can adapt um, with the technology that is being deployed, uh, because we all need this technology as well. So it's a, there's a tension there. So anyway, to talk about um, both sides of the argument, and 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 you know how we can do something about it. Uh, uh, we have three experts here, and um, I'm going to read and introduce their biographies, and then we're going to hear a little bit of an introduction from each of them, and uh, then we're going to have a discussion. So uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Frederica Di Bruno. 
um, who is tuning in from Europe at the moment. And so it's, it's very, very late or early, depending on which way you think about it. Uh, Frederico is the Spectrum Manager at the SKA Observatory and Co-Director at the IAU, International Astronomical Union, Center for the Protection of the Dark and Quiet Sky from Satellite Constellation Interference. That's a wonderful job title, and you need a very long business card for that. Uh, before his involvement in radio astronomy, he worked in the space industry, specifically in electromagnetic compatibility and radio frequency interference in communication and scientific spacecraft. So welcome, Frederico. Uh, we have Emma Loudon. Hi, Emma. Emma is an astrophysicist, uh, strategist, and speaker. She's currently at Yale University as a PhD candidate in astrophysics, pursuing a thesis focused on the dynamics and architecture of extraplanetary systems. She has a passion for space mission design, organizational strategy, and philanthropic work focused on women's empowerment. Good evening, Emma. Uh, last but not least, we have uh, Matthew Goodman. Uh, Matthew is an engineer, entrepreneur, and imaging scientist. He currently runs Exclosure, a space situational awareness company which focuses on the optical tracking of near-Earth objects. He enjoys silly math problems. Um, maybe we'll get into those later. Um, the building high voltage art. We won't go into that later. Uh, and uh, complaining about timekeeping standards, which is fitting because we're all in different time zones at the moment. So uh, thank you and welcome all of you. I think what we'll do is we'll um, take it one person at a time. We've got a few slides to share just to introduce the topic and introduce the various aspects of the topic as we move forward. And then we'll have a discussion. And after that, open it up to the questions um, of you, the audience. So I'm going to share now, uh, Frederico, we'll get your slides up. Um, let's see how smoothly we can do this. Okay. Oops. Sorry, uh, I'm at the last slide there. That's not good. I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to, there we go. It's always good to start off with the problems. Here we go. How is that? Perfect. Yes. All right. Good, good. Thanks. Thank you very much, Simon. And thanks, thanks everyone for, for having me here. It's, it's really great to be here. Okay, so I have the great honor to make the very short introduction to this to this topic. And I'd like to start first talking about space and, and what how we rely on space, right? Space is a great thing. We can we can, thanks to space technology, we can watch satellite TV, we can rely on our sat maps to blame someone else when we get lost. We can forecast the weather, we can see pictures of the earth at crazy resolutions. We have internet connection almost everywhere in the world now and other countless of things, thanks to space technology, thanks to satellites. Now, some years ago, thanks to technology advancements, the year of these large constellations or so-called mega constellations, although they're not in a million, but they're really large started. And, and these are systems composed of hundreds or thousands of satellites in low Earth orbit. As you see there in this picture on the right, low Earth orbit is a region of space under 2000 kilometers altitude. So it's, it's, it's big, but it's not, um, it's not infinite. And the, the exciting part of, of all of this is that it took only two years and two satellite operators roughly to duplicate the numbers of active satellites in low Earth orbit. As you can see here in this, on the left side in this curve lab, labeled active or in blue. Uh, and one could think great, more benefits from space and you're partly correct, right? More benefit from, from space, more things that we can do from space, but there's always a catch, right? With so many satellites in a finite space like LEO, uh, they are also creating problems. So apart from the very obvious one of crowded orbits, which could result in a cascaded collision chain, sometimes called the Kessler syndrome, these satellites are also reflecting sunlight and they also use radio frequencies to communicate with Earth, to transmit signals to Earth. And these last two effects are becoming a problem for astronomy and for the night sky. Next slide, please. But of course, these are, these are not, not new things, right? Satellites have always reflected sunlight and have always used radio signals, right? So what's the problem here? The, the situation is the numbers. There are currently about 6,500 active satellites in low Earth orbit, and there are plans to reach more than 400,000 
by 2030. And so here you see as, as a, a depiction of this, a very recent all sky capture from New Zealand. And those things you see there are not fireflies, those are satellites reflecting sunlight. So I will end this very short introduction with two open questions. One is, are we facing a fundamental change in the night sky as we know it? And will it be able to still, will we be able to still probe the universe with optical and radio telescopes and of course look for extraterrestrial intelligence? All right, I, I think I just okay. need to keep going now. Right. So <laughs> yes. Yeah, so so that's that's a very very nice overview, and that is a, a beautiful but scary um, night sky image. And they are flying all over the place, aren't they? It's, yeah. You, you, yeah. You, you think you of satellites, everything's again. going in the same direction. They're going everywhere. <laughs> it's just thirty <laughs> seconds, but it, I think it's an amazing thing to see, and it, it really shows shows the situation and how how the night sky is evolving. Uh, yeah. So not many maybe so, not, not many people has the, the ability to see that. In, in their sky, but it's really happening. Yeah. So you're going to give a little overview now from the radio perspective, aren't you? Let's yep. let's let's have a look Indeed. here about that. All right. Good. As as Simon said at the beginning, I work at the radio observatory, so I'll give you the the radio perspective of this. And and just to try to explain the radio, I want you to think on how how radio astronomy works. That we have very very large antennas or very sensitive antennas looking up to the sky, trying to receive signals from celestial sources that are extremely far away, like, for example, the Crab Nebula, 6,500 light years away. And of course, we will receive the extremely faint radio signals, right? Really, really small. And now you can imagine this shell of satellites that is, is being populated more and more and more. And you can think how these radio signals that are billions of times uh, more strong or stronger than the radio signals coming from celestial sources are going to interact or are going to interfere with the signals we are trying to detect right so these are very very bright signals and as the satellites move they can go in the main beams of the telescopes which have a very very large gain or they can go into the side lobes of the antennas because anten radio antennas can receive signals from any direction, basically, just with different gains, different sensitivity. And so that, that's just to imagine the problem. And what can happen with radio telescopes is that it can go in, in different levels of severity, right? So the, the worst one, it can saturate receivers. So you can basically lose the, the whole observation of the receiver, is, this is not damage, right? It's just saturation. So the, the signals are too bright for us to be able to, to discern things or to take parts away of the signal. The, the second one is that we can lose parts of the observable radio spectrum. So imagine this as, as windows, right? We have different windows and we could lose some of these windows because of these very strong radio signals. And the third one is that we would basically need more time to have the same sensitivity. We, we will need more observing time to be able to get to the same sensitivity because we just need to throw away part of the temporal data that we are collecting with the antennas. Next slide, please. And then there is a further complication for the radio side, which is that the radio spectrum is actually a very, very large thing and it's shared by many, many users. Right, so as you see there in the picture on the right, the radio spectrum goes up to a few hundred gigahertz maybe. And, and we use it also all the time, also on earth, right? Cell phones, um, TV stations, radio broadcasting, whatever you think uses radio frequencies. So on the left, what you see there, and don't, don't worry, I'm not expecting anyone to read <laughs> any of those little boxes, uh, but all those different colors, that, that, sorry, that thing on the left is called the table of frequency allocations. That one is particularly from the US, I think. Um, and all those, those little colors, so, so from the left, top left to the bottom right, that's from about a few kilohertz to 300 gigahertz. So that's the whole radio spectrum there divided in little pieces which are called services. So that's who is that little part of the spectrum assigned to, right? And in there, very little yellow parts are assigned to radio astronomy. So those very small chunks, 
that you can find somewhere. And I challenge some of you to find those <laughs> uh, are assigned to radio astronomy. So, and these are the, the windows I'm talking about, right? There are these very defined and sometimes really narrow windows for radio astronomy. And so we, we need to observe there because of different uh, different reasons, mostly because we are trying to observe natural sources right? and, and these things in space emit in very particular frequencies. So we have to go exactly there. For example, like the 1,400 uh, megahertz a hydrogen line, which is, is a protected band in the ITU and, and it's there in yellow. Uh, but also radio astronomy ad has advanced so much that we can observe in wide band, right? Our, our, our detectors, our receivers are wide band. And in order to, to be able to use that and, and not have all these different signals coming into our telescopes, we build the telescopes really far away from civilization in ideally in what is called radio quiet zones. So for example, in, in the US, there's a radio quiet zone in Green Bank and also in in South Africa and Australia, where the SKA is building our telescopes, there's a, there are two radio quiet zones. And so radio quiet zones act at the national level, managing all this big colorful table, as in a sense that you can think that everything is painted just yellow. Just I'm very, making a very big simplification, but sort of that. The trick is that that works at the national level and that doesn't apply to satellites. And that's the challenge here, right? So we are seeing that before there was a few satellites, we knew where they were, all right? So we, we can make observations and then find out things. And now there are so, so many satellites that some of these windows we see are getting narrower or blurrier, one can say. And that's, I think, is the, the perspective from the astronomy. Okay, thank you. Um, so this, uh, as I, bring up uh, Emma's slide now, uh, now you're going to close that. Uh, so, so the issue, of course, with radio is that that is actually the satellites working, they're transmitting. So you, so you, you know, they're, they're sending signals that are getting in the way. Whereas from the optical perspective, it's actually different. It's, it's the, 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 the telescopes physically getting, getting in the way. So um, I'm going to just uh, bring up uh, Emma's slide now, and she can talk about the the optical perspective. Perfect. Yeah, it's definitely important to understand that both the working of the telescopes and the existence of the of the working of the satellites and the existence of the satellites can cause problems for astronomy. So, okay. How is that? I don't see the slides. You don't see the slides. Oops. Were well, the slides not visible then? Okay, let me try again. Okay, let me try this. Here we go. How is that? Perfect. Oh, good. Okay, that's a relief. Good. <laughs> Every, everything vanished on my screen. <laughs> I love it when that happens. Okay, take it away, Emma. <laughs> okay, perfect. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the satellite constellations in terms of optical astronomy. So I'm an optical astronomer. I specifically look at exoplanets, so planets outside of our solar system. And if you go to the next slide, I have a plot here that just shows all of the exoplanets that we know of outside of our solar system right now. So there's about 5,000, and a lot of those are studied using optical telescopes such as the one on the next slide, which is the Keck telescopes. So those are what I use for my PhD research. I am looking at the architectures of these systems. So we're getting spectrographic measurements of the stars using the um, high resolution spectrograph on Keck. And we're able to figure out um, the architectures of these systems and from there learn about planet formation. But more and more, the skies, um, which used to be pristine in a place like on the top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii, where you could get just clear, beautiful, low uh, humidity, just great conditions, are now seeing a sky that is spotted by satellites. So that's why I'm inter interested in this as an optical astronomer, is that the number of satellites is just continuing to grow and they're crossing in front of our telescopes. And every time the satellites cross in front of the telescope, they're blocking out 
light from these distant regions that we're trying to capture. And every single photon is valuable in astronomy. So every photon that gets blocked out by a satellite is one that we lose. It's data that's lost and you don't know a priori which um, observations have satellites going through them, at least right now. Um, so there's a need to take more data, which is redundant, and it just cascades into problems for optical astronomers. Um, if you go forward one slide, another reason that this causes problems is that satellites can collide with one another, and then you get pieces of debris that can also show up, especially in wide field surveys. Um, and these wide field surveys that rely on larger pictures of the sky, they have larger fields of view, um, the debris blocks more and more photons that they're trying to collect and can be mistaken for other objects if we can't track their orbits very well. So for smaller pieces, pieces of debris, especially, that is a problem. What you're seeing here on the slide is an example of a satellite that um, was broken apart into pieces of debris. And you can see how it goes from one dot in the sky to all these different dots that then cause more impact on the astronomical data. The next slide, please. Um, one of the other reasons that we all should really be thinking about this and care is that um, what you're seeing here is a image from JPL of the simulated orbits of all of the near Earth asteroids. Um, near Earth asteroids are important if you're thinking about planetary protection from the perspective of we don't want an asteroid to hit us like we did for the dinosaurs. And in this case, um, satellites can masquerade as near-Earth asteroids or vice versa in these surveys that are designed to help look for new potentially deadly asteroids. So that is a kind of existential reason why um, satellites are a problem for optical astronomy that matters to the entire world. Uh, as, until we can very clearly distinguish satellites from near-Earth asteroids in our data, um, we're at more risk of <laughs> asteroids hitting us. So from an optical astronomy perspective, it's really about the number of the satellites in the sky, where they are, where their orbits are, and being able to track those orbits and distinguish them from the astronomical objects in our data. And then let's see. So I guess I kind of alluded to this already, but a lot of these wide field instruments that are um, still coming online are some of the ones that are going to be most impacted by these satellite constellations. So this is the Vera Rubin Observatory. If you don't know who Vera Rubin is, Google her. She's an amazing, amazing um, astronomer who like laid the groundwork. Uh, but that's beside the point for satellites. But this observatory, which is named after her, is going to be conducting wide field surveys of the sky and um, one of the biggest concerns is satellites in the data. And how do you get rid of the satellites? How can you write algorithms that can do that? What about the data that they're blocking? And this is the kind of telescope where um, satellites are going to be in the data no matter what you do. So figuring out how to mitigate those effects is going to be a critical challenge for optical astronomy in the coming decades. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Uh, let's uh, end the share there. Um, all right. And while I bring up uh, uh, Matt's presentation, of course, you know, the satellite companies aren't doing this because they hate astronomers, you know, they're, we're on the whole a nice sort of harmless bunch. So what, what, is, what is going on? Why, why is this important to do from various perspectives? And, and Matt, I'm going to let you uh, take it away and I'm going to try to share this properly at this time. <laughs> We're, uh, I definitely represent the the kind of odd duck in this in this bucket here. Um, we're actually trying to take pictures <laughs> of satellites, so um, we'll talk about a little bit as to why that is. But um, Emma really actually teed this problem up really closely. It's really hard to figure out where these things are. If you look up in the sky and you take a long exposure with the telescope, you might be seeing an asteroid, you might be seeing a satellite, it might be streaking, it might be blocking it out. It's really hard to know uh, what's what and where things are generally in space. So um, I, I actually kind of uh, really at core, I started a small business as a result of part of this as the problem statement. Uh, in 2016, I took a photo of the night sky and I saw five satellites in that photo. And I was like, that's a, a pretty strange, you know, kind of bizarre moment coincidence. And, um, you know, lo and behold, you, you try to figure out where these things are. I did a little bit of research about where I could find data about it. And um, there's much less out there than you'd expect. 
So uh, five or six years after that fact, I decided it was a good time to actually start a little company. This is kind of how I participate in the world. I, I start little companies to try to solve problems. And one of those problem statements is, is that there's stuff in orbit and it's hard to track and it's hard to categorize. And um, it turns out there's an entire small industry here that it does nothing but keep track of stuff in space and satellites. Uh, it's called space situational awareness kind of generally. Uh, and we are one of uh, several companies that does this sort of thing. We're a little bit different because we actually kind of come at it from an environmental standpoint first. We really care about working with um, astronomers, especially. Uh, I got in contact with this whole program as a result of um, talking to some folks at Vera Rubin about how we could hopefully help them out. And that kind of got me shuffled into SATCON and later things. So um, yeah, that's what we do. Uh, can you hit the next slide for me? Uh, and to do that, we actually build these little tiny telescopes. I don't know if people can see my face right now, but I, I can hold up uh, one of them a little bit later. They're like about knee high, uh, really cute little things. And these objects go on the roofs of volunteer sites and other uh, various privileged locations and keep track of stuff in space. Can you hit one more slide for me? And we're trying to get about 20 to 30 of these out in the world. Right now we have about eight today. Uh, there's a few on my roof here. There's a few in uh, the Canary Islands with one of our uh, lovely employees. And um, we're putting out more and more of these things to try to both help astronomers and help uh, constellation operators operate in a way that's um, really safe, ethical, and environmentally considerate. Um, yeah, so one more slide for me. Beautiful. And this is a little bit of an example of some of the sorts of data we take. You see these tiny little white streaks, and we've drawn these like dotted lines to indicate uh, where we think satellites are and where we're, various things we're tracking are or aren't. And um, if you look at those rather carefully, you'll discover that uh, if you only use public data sources, you'll be pretty inaccurate about where these things are, uh, which is part of the major complaint that astronomers have for what all is going on there. And um, at the end of the day, we don't put satellites in space because they're convenient. We put them up there because they offer human utility. It's an enormous amount of effort to even get something the size of a shoebox to orbit the Earth. So it really has to come with some real benefits. And um, it's, it's one of these things also that we tend to forget exists because it's kind of invisible. We don't think about the fact that when we pull our phone out for directions, there's a constellation of GPS satellites that are supporting our navigation. We don't think about it when we see news stories that, you know, um, human rights violations, et cetera, going on in faraway places. That's, you know, like hard news to swallow, but it's a result of Earth observation activities. Similarly, and there's all these humanitarian and environmental aspects to um, seeing what's on our Earth in, in, a, in a farther up viewpoint. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the guy who's saying, like, we love the sky. I love the Milky Way, but also these things have utility and we, we need to figure out a balanced kind of way that we all can use this together. Mm -hmm. So that's all I got. Great. Thank you. Uh, let me just end the, the share here and get rid of that slide. That is wonderful. Um, I don't know if any of you want to comment on, on the others' presentations just yet. I, I do have just to start things off. These are all in what's called low Earth orbit. Um, and one of my thinking, you know, questions is a lot of the early uh, communication satellites, and these are communications, are up in geosynchronous orbit, which are a long way out. Um, why, why are they so close now? Why are they just sort of, you know, and, and maybe say a little bit for people who, who are not familiar with the term low Earth orbit, you know, why are they there and, and what do we mean by low? And I don't know if, if Frederico wants to uh, take that one away. Yeah, sure. I, I love that one. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the first reason of why low Earth orbit is, is mainly because being closer to Earth, and this is from from a perspective of the satellites providing internet service right being closer to earth the time latency for signals to go from earth to the satellite and back right think of the satellite as a relay or something bouncing off signals is much shorter than going into geostationary orbit right geostationary orbit is about 35000 kilometers i think so i hope i'm not getting my numbers wrong uh, anyone can double check this and, and let me know. But I, I think it's about there. And low Earth orbit stops at about 2,000 kilometers. So they, they are much closer and the latency is, is, is less. So that's from the perspective of the, the satellites and providing a service, right? Giving internet 
and in the situation for astronomy, at least for radio astronomy, but I'm, well, I'm sure for, for optical it's a little bit different, but for radio astronomy, satellites have always sent radio signals to Earth, right? This is not something new. The, the, the thing is that geostationary satellites are fixed in the sky, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's why someone can have their sky antenna looking at some place, always looking at the same bunch of oh, part of the sky, right? Because the satellite is actually there and it moves as fast as the earth. So it always stays in the same place, right? As, as we rotate. Um, and that what, what gives, what makes it simple for radio astronomy at least is that we know where the satellites are. So as long as you don't point your antenna directly to the satellite, you're not that bad, right? You're not receiving so much strong signals. So you're, you're looking somewhere else, you're fine. Now with LEO, the thing is that satellites rotate much faster. So they take about 90 minutes to make an orbit around the Earth. So this is really, really quick. So as you saw in the, in the video, right? Satellites are moving really fast. And, and now it changes things because you're observing somewhere and satellites are just going through and they are all over the place. So that was what Matt was saying that we now need to know where satellites are and it's really difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, anything to add to that, Matt? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, yeah. So there, there's a couple of reasons also that um, people tend to like LEO. Uh, and most of them are kind of new. There's been some real changes in our ability to kind of, um, it's really like steer radio beams is the way to kind of uh, dumb it down a little bit. But you basically, you can have a um, something like a radio array that can point at objects as they're moving overhead. So that's been a very big deal that's really enabled people to use LEO satellites at all at all. Um, the other factor that I'd put out there is that Earth observation, it's easier to see stuff when you're closer. And I, I think everybody can kind of like grok that in a rather, you know, pretty simple way. Um, but fundamentally, the uh, kind of the pair of these two has really pushed, uh, and, and obviously like the communication stuff, but the, the, pair, the pair of these things have really pushed people to start working closer and closer. Uh, one, one of the other facets about GEO is that um, it's actually a very, very small region of space. So it has to be this very thin ring kind of around the equator and at a very specific distance. It's slightly closer to 36,000, but it's fine. Um, the, uh, that, this is also one of the first areas that was really regulated in a real way because it was so contentious. Um, ultimately, there's like, I want to say like only a few hundred objects up there. You know, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I know much less about Geo than Leo. But um, they're assigned specific slots in particular locations above the Earth. And that's a very, um, I would say, contentious process. That's really why the IT was formed, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, totally. Yep. He's still nodding me over Definitely. there. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, that part, if I may just quickly, mm -hmm. that, that part is very interesting on the regulations, right? Because as, as Matt was saying, GEO is, is very well regulated. And every country in the world basically has a slot an angular slot uh -huh. in there. Uh -huh. So every country knows that we have so many degrees in geo to put our satellites there, right? So everyone can, can use their part of the geo orbit. And of course it coincides where, where you see the satellite, right? You're not going to get on, on the other way of the earth. Uh, but the problem for LEO is very different in, in case of equitable access, right? Because now the, the orbits are very much or very much harder to define. And so that, that's a very big question right now going on in, in the ITU specifically, the International Telecommunications Union, that is where all the, the use of the radio spectrum is regulated and also use of the radio spectrum from space. And so that, that question is out there. And I think there's not a clear answer at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> Just in case yeah. someone's thinking. And correct me if I'm wrong, Emma, also the, the LEO satellites have a substantially worse um, optical impact, right? Because they're unpredictable and much brighter. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So the higher altitude constellations can be visible all night long, especially in the summertime, which is why one of the prime recommendations for how to handle um, reflectivity of satellites, which is where a lot of the issue comes from, at least right now, um, with the magnitude that we have up there, is um, trying to limit satellites to be below 600 kilometers in altitude. Um, which from a like geometry perspective is just like how much they can be in the sky and be lit by the sun when you're on the dark side of the earth. 
um, as you're in nighttime, how much they can still be getting sunlight. And if they're higher up, that triangle is bigger. So they can be reflecting all night long versus if they're lower in the sky, the sunlight's reflection is going to be only present for the like dawn and dusk parts of the night sky. Um, so that's a real important recommendation that astronomers have come up with in terms of how operators can design constellations that will be better for astronomy is to try and put them lower um, so that they're limited in how much they reflect. Thank you. Uh, I do have a question uh, again on, on the practicalities of, of astronomy, but I just want to remind everybody, um, great, thank you put, for putting where you're from in the chat, but if you have questions that you want to pose to, to our panelists, uh, pop those in the in the Q&A, and we have uh, Rebecca and Beth behind the scenes um, organizing your questions for, for a few minutes' time. Um, but Emma, just speaking as, as an astronomer, um, you know, you, 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 do an observation, you, you do an integration onto a, 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 an electronic detector, CCD. Um, there's always a lot of, of stuff on that detector. There's cosmic rays, which are everywhere, um, you know, and then uh, satellites and, you know, uh, uh, mess, messing things up that you've, uh, astronomers have always had to remove from the data. Um, I just wondered if you could say a little bit about, you know, in terms of maybe photometry and spectroscopy, um, what processes, you know, uh, are used to, to clean up your, your image and, you know, what new techniques you might have to employ now with, with uh, satellites, you know, getting in the way. Well, if you are have been on the internet recently, you've probably encountered chat GPT. So you've seen people using AI in all sorts of interesting ways. Um, and astronomers are not immune to that bug. And a lot of people will say that that is going to be some of the answers to our problems with satellites is being able to find algorithms that can detect satellites in our data and effectively just remove it. Um, but whenever we think about that, we have to remember the prime um, ratio for astronomers, which is signal to noise. And every satellite adds more noise and your signal goes down and your detection is less confident. You're less assured of what you're seeing. You're less assured of what data you're collecting. Um, so for spectroscopy in particular, it's a problem because you often have to have your, um, like your uh, exposure times are longer. So your probability of having a satellite go through can get higher if you're integrating for of order 2000 seconds instead of a very a shorter time. Um, that if it crosses in front of your um, IFU or in front of the slit, then that observation is kind of done, but you don't know that when it's on sky. Um, you don't know that until it's read out. If you're looking at the data immediately, you probably don't know it until you look at the data in the next morning. Okay. Um, so there's a real problem in that we it'll probably result in having to do more observations to the same parts of the sky, which is telescope time is expensive. But I mean, a night on CAC is about a hundred thousand dollars worth of like time, money, energy, mm -hmm. like it's a lot. So those, it's not a trivial task to go ahead and do those kind of observations over and over. And then from a photometry perspective, I think it's mostly um, trying to use machine learning to dig out what is satellites and what is not, but then you run into the issue of what if you get rid of an asteroid that we don't know about and mm -hmm. um, what are the potential implications of that? So right. there's not really a great answer right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the work in progress. So, so yes, you, you know, there, there are false positives, but but the worrying thing is if you take out the the, the, the positive that is there, um, which, which is very important. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, just a there seems to be a growth industry. Um, you know, you start off with one satellite in 1957, then you get a few more, and, and suddenly they're putting up 100,000. Um, so, Matthew, d tell us a little bit about the, the business um, of, of satellite constellations or satellite swarms, which sounds a bit more menacing, <laughs> constellations. Yeah, yeah. This is a growth industry, literally. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, um, depending on what you believe, uh, and there's data sources, I believe more, and there's data sources, I believe less. Uh, you know, somebody will quote that there's 300,000 satellites planned for the next decade. And um, it turns out most of that is actually part of one single filing from, I want to say, Rwanda. For, for you to reflect, fix me if yep. I'm wrong on this. Yeah, 327,000. Something like that, yeah. And um, I also, I actually consider that piece of paperwork almost a form of performance art. Um, Jonathan McDowell quoted something. He was like, well, like, 
all of the launch systems combined on the earth could not service this right so there's, there's some like very catastrophic numbers you'll hear out there that i think are a little bit extreme but that being said i think it's still going to be a, a pretty extreme environment and it's if you think about the size of space there's tons and tons of space compared to the size of satellites so if we really were super thoughtful and we all played along super cleanly and super well it would not be a problem at all Unfortunately, I think there's now 91 different countries that have objects up there. And that represents at least um, kind of what I refer to as three or four different umbrellas of ethical frameworks. And uh, so when you say it's a growth industry, it's like, well, wh which one are you talking about? Are you talking about, you know, just the commercial commsats? Are you talking about the entire Earth observation segment? Are you talking about the, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? So um, it's simultaneously a little bit exciting and a little bit terrifying. Um, because there's not a consensus uh, regulatory body on this right now. There's not a consensus set of rules. There's not a consensus set of protocols. And mostly, um, mostly this comes back to launch providers. Like some of them comply with various UN requirements, some don't. Uh, and it wouldn't it wouldn't take you very much googling or guessing to to reach some conclusions there. But does that answer your question at all? Or? Yeah, no, I, I, I think this idea of regulation and, and of course, you know, the, I don't know the Outer Space Treaty that, yeah. that is, was a, is a UN treaty, whether this has any bearing, uh, Frederico, on what's happening. It, it sounds as though it's like a sort of gold rush. There's, there's very little regulation. And um, yeah. what, what's, uh, what's being done at this point? Right. So I, I think we, we need to first understand how space is regulated. And the, the answer is that space is regulated at the national level, right? So each country or most countries who signed the Outer Space Treaty, which is, is basically a guideline to, with very defined things, but very broad. And I, I'm not a specialist there, right? I, I, I saw it, I read it, but it's, it's not like very defined things or, or they're defined, but it's not very strict. And, and so it's regulated at the national level. And so each, each, each country defines what are the requirements for a, a person, let's say, or someone to send the satellite in space, right? So you need to comply to some national rules because at the end, the country is the one who is responsible for what you put out there, right? So if tomorrow I want to put out the satellite from the UK, the UK is at the end responsible with for for my satellite out there if something happens with some other satellite from the US, for example, right? And, and that defines the rules at the national level. And, and those rules at the moment, people are seeing that are not enough for, for the situation that is coming in Leo, right? The, the situation before was, was much simpler because satellite systems were made of one satellite, two satellites, maybe 60 satellites was the, one of the largest constellations of the Iridium satellites. Uh, and, and so that was much simpler because everyone understood where everyone was and they were really far away. And so no one was really concerned about having collisions, although it happened. It happened that, that two satellites just collided with each other. It also happened that some countries did some testing to see if they could destroy a satellite it also happened, uh, but the situation now is is becoming much more concerning, and and people is discussing a lot about, especially about space sustainability, right? So, what is the sustainable use of space, and and of course the impact to astronomy and the impact to the night sky falls in there, but it's a much larger discussion, right? It's, it's a discussion of how we use space in a sustainable way. And, and we are sure that our activities are, are bringing a lot of good, a lot of new connectivities, a lot of new uh, technological advancements, but at the same time also are keeping space sustainable, right? We need to be able to keep using space and keep using this LEO environment, which is really valuable and it's not infinite at all. Mm -hmm. And just sticking on, uh, Wearing your other hat as a radio astronomer, um, you know, the, obviously there's a, if you're just getting reflections off of the, the solar panels for the, the optical, then, then yeah. you know, it, it's, it's a broad, you know, uh, continuous spectrum. 
Um, so typically these, these constellation satellites, what uh, they, are they required or is this another regulation issue to stick to particular wavelength bands? You know, you said yeah. we, we'd like to keep the 21 centimeter uh, free mm -hmm. because yeah. that's quite yeah. fundamental. Uh, are, are people abusing this or are they playing, playing fair at the moment? No, no, at, at the moment, this is really new, right? All these new con constellations are just being deployed right now. Uh -huh. So it's uh -huh. a matter of time to say exactly that if, if everyone is keeping to their slots, let's say, uh -huh. frequency uh -huh. slots. Uh, but the, so the situation for radio astronomy is, is a little bit different than the optical because satellites are intentionally sending signals to Earth, right? And these signals can come in, in many different frequency bands and those frequency bands will affect different science cases of, of radio astronomy. And so that, that is one of the concerns, right? Where, where are the downlink signals of the satellites and which frequency bands they can affect? For example, and, and the, the tricky part is that the regulation only protects radio astronomy in these very narrow bands that I was mentioning before. And so we, we need to make sure that the satellites are not polluting these little bands, right? Mm -hmm. But there's not much we can do at the ITU or at the regulatory level for the continuum spectrum, because that spectrum needs to be shared, right? It, it's, it's the rules of the game, right? We all need to share the spectrum. And mm -hmm. so that's where the, the conversations with operators are, have been really good so far. In, in arguing that for very special sites, like these radio quiet zones I was referring before in, in the US, in South Africa, in Australia, in China, many, many different places have radio quiet zones, which are in the order of 12 or 13 around the world. And we are trying to argue with operators to say, look, in these radio quiet zones, please try to keep your beams away. Right? One of the interesting things about all this technology is that these satellites have very narrow beams beaming at cells of the size of like 20 kilometers, something like that, and they can move them around. It doesn't mean like when, when they illuminate one cell, nothing goes outside, right? These are real antennas and there, are, there is spillage, let's say, in other directions, but most of the, the energy is there. And so we are arguing like, look, try to steer your beams away from, from radio telescopes and try to lower the amount of power that goes in there. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the main concern, but there are some others. And, and one of them is of course, reflections from terrestrial transmissions, right? So if you have uh, transmissions, very, very powerful transmissions from, for example, FM radios that are really far away from radio telescopes because we want to be able to see what's going on in those frequencies we put the radio telescope as far away as possible. But if now there's something that is reflecting these radio waves, as it can happen with the ISS, right? For example, people do that for, for ham radio, for example, using the ISS to bounce or using the moon to bounce signals. And this yeah. can also happen with satellites. If you have enough satellites out there, it, it can create some sort of mesh and can start bouncing off signals from very far away. Uh -huh. So we can suddenly have the, the same environment as we have somewhere else on earth in, in radio wave zones. It, it's, it's a bit of an extreme case, but it is what can happen. Yeah. Ask, case, to, but, yeah. But, but also like there's literally a hobbyist community that demonstrated you could track satellites using passive oh, yeah. FM. Uh, they actually got in a little bit of trouble. And that's a whole uh, sure. funny side note there. But um, basically, they listen for reflections of FM transmitters off of satellites to figure out where they are. Yeah. So it's it's not it's not unrealistic. You know, people with hobbyist level instrumentation can pick this up, which means the professional radio folks, it must just be blinding bright crazy for them. So. <laughs> yeah. How, uh, Matt, uh, in your experience with the industry, uh, uh, are people cooperating with each other? Is there, is there consensus? Are, are, you know, are, are, you know, are one company from from you know South Africa talking to another company from the UK, or, or you know, are these you know, are people sort of really sort of uh, running 
this in isolation as they develop new systems? Um, it, it varies a lot. It's hard to generalize. I'd say that um, mostly people who own space assets are really interested in not running into each other. So like there, there's a pure like deep financial interest there, which is um, while self-serving, it is useful. Uh, also, there's been at least two or three instances of folks doing pretty explicit mitigations to try to lower um, mainly brightness. That was one of the big early concerns. If you ever saw the early Starlink trains, they're kind of startling, honestly. Um, and, um, you know, for, for all the flax SpaceX gets, I think they've actually been pretty good citizens as it comes in terms of like both publishing uh, their own ephemeris and trying to do brightness mitigations. And the other the other big thing that people talk about less is that um, they publish their maneuvering criteria. So they say, this is where we are. This is how we'll move to avoid stuff. And this is what we're doing to try to make things dimmer. So I, I you know, they have a big impact because they have a big count. But in the category of effort put forward, I think they're pretty off the charts in some ways. Um, in terms of working with each other, it varies, again, a lot. So, uh, you know, all the military folks are super spooky. They don't talk to anybody about what they do. You just have to assume that they're <laughs> going to get out of your way. Um, then similarly, um, you know, folks in Russia and China have a, a pretty different set of um, incentives and ethical frameworks at play. So yeah. uh, while the astronomy communities there are actually pretty awesome and pretty strong, like the, uh, I think the MMT5 was one of the earliest folks that started doing real uh, satellite statistics. Um, it's still like there's a pretty big cultural gap there that's that's challenging. Yeah. We're going to go on to, to audience questions in a second. Emma, I just want to, you mentioned the Vera Rubin telescope. The, it's a special new type of telescope, um, which is particularly susceptible to this. So I, is there any way that, that a, a, a wide field telescope can can help, you know, in, you know, determining where these objects are uh, for uh, and you use that to, to help other uh, communities in astronomy. Say a little bit about Vera Rubin. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I was just saying that's an interesting case because the yeah. um, the telescope is designed to be able to track objects like the interstellar comet that came through the solar system a couple of years ago now called Oumuamua. Um, it's designed to be able to pick up these orbits of objects that we may not know are out there. I mean, it has a lot of purposes, but this is one of them that is relevant to satellites. Um, and in this case, it means that you'll be able to essentially track all of the satellites that are in the sky that it sees um, and figure out the orbits from there, um, which has a lot of interesting implications. Um, but there's possibilities, I think, for figuring out orbits of Emerus is better that way. Um, but again, like as Matthew mentioned, like there's the um, national security case for like, you don't really like there are certain like uh, militaries that don't want people to be able to figure out where their satellites are. So that data has a lot of interesting implications that I don't think have all been quite figured out yet. Matthew, if you wanted to say something. Yeah, quick, quick, quick response to that, and then we'll yeah, go yeah. to the questions. <laughs> um, at least, so one thing that we've been trying to work with um, CPS on pretty specifically is developing a way where uh, they can send us a list of things they want to image, and we can send back like windows that we think are going to be free of satellite interference. And that's, that's a bit of a subtle shift from the, the other kind of way of thinking about it, where you have a picture and you're trying to figure out what the satellites are and how to remove them. The upside of it is that um, you don't have to handle any of this uh, data of where satellites are, whose they are, whether or not they're classified military spooky, ITAR, et cetera. Um, and instead you just like have these kind of windows you can shoot through. Uh, I think that's very doable for small aperture stuff or like spectroscopy type applications. I think the Vera Rubin is a very different creature though. Um, so its field of view is uh, approximately gigantic compared to what you'd normally think of in terms of normal telescopes. And uh, I, I have like a deep emotional connection to that one. I was actually at Stuart Mirror Lab when the mirrors were cast like a decade ago now. So I, I, I love it and I've kind of been watching it as I grow up. But it was a it was a device that was designed for a different environment. It's kind of like an mm -hmm. ugly feeling I have pretty often. And um, mm. you can go read a bunch about this in particular, but it's like the average photo it takes will have like four satellites in it by the time it has first light or something like that. And that's, that's hard feelings, you know? Um, hard feels. Let's, um, let's go on to some questions from the audience. Uh, I know, um, Frederico, you have a little more to say about the IAU and we'll bring up your slide at the end. But uh, um, And 
these are anyone can have a go at these, but I, I'll just direct them um, uh, to to uh, one of you at a time. Uh, first question is. Orbital mechanics is fairly well understood. Why can't we predict where the satellites are, Matthew? Can we? This, to some extent, is the short answer. So, if you have um, a fair, if you have an accurate, I should say, accurate air quotes set of ephemeris, you can predict for maybe a week, maybe two. Uh, at the two week mark, you'll be missing by several kilometers uh, at very minimum. The um, and for like astronomy type stuff where you're like really, uh, you know, kilometers are a big, big unit in the size of these uh, telescope apertures. So that level of uncertainty is kind of hard for you. Um, if you're just trying to point your radar dish to catch a radar signal, like it might be fine. Uh, but at the end of the day, that uncertainty actually comes from a bunch of different facets, including um, solar weather and all sorts of other like permutive gravitational forces of moon, planets, tides, et cetera. Uh, one of the other small nightmares that feeds into all of this is that the um, Earth doesn't rotate the same amount every day. It's off by a few milliseconds. So even if your ephemeris is, is time locked to a different predictive thing and you don't include the forward timekeeping process, it's going to start being wrong. And um, these all things seem super trivial, but it's important to remember that objects that are traveling at like tens of kilometers a second, if you're like 0.01% wrong about what direction they're heading, that's like off by many kilometers, like very quickly. Um, so it's just like kind of it's it's a it's a, there's a non-intuitive level of accuracy that you need to maintain on these objects. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, there is a plea, and this one's for Emma. A plea from uh, amateurs, amateur astronomers, and citizen science astronomers. Um, any any words of encouragement or or advice <laughs> <laughs> moving forward? Well, I am perhaps a pessimistic astronomer, but at the same time, really optimistic in that I think that we're not going to stop the growth of satellite constellations. I think it's kind of an inevitable growth. And I don't think it, that's necessarily a bad thing. Like for all the reasons that Matthew pointed out, these satellites are adding tremendous value in so many cases to the world and to humanity, to be able to track humanitarian crises, to figure out where floods are going to be, to be able to get day by day imaging for climate change. All of those are incredibly useful reasons to have these satellites on top of getting broadband internet to everyone around the world, connecting people. Um, so my, I guess to amateur astronomers, I think we're just gonna have to learn to deal with it. Um, we're gonna have to figure out, I saw somebody talking about in the chat, like being able to connect your telescope in your backyard to an app that can tell you if you're gonna have satellites crossing. Um, I think that that's going to be the, re the reality that we live in. And in some ways, that's an amazing opportunity for astronomy because it gives us a chance to proactively plan for a future where the sky is changing. Um, I mean, we've been doing astronomy for however many centuries now in a sky that was essentially not changing at all. And now in the past 50 years, our sky is no longer subject to this status quo. And so our previous methods of planning that worked even 30, 40 years ago, don't necessarily apply to our current sky. And that can be a really saddening perspective. And I think in some ways it is, but at the same time, it's a real opportunity to think about how we can um, work within this framework and make it work, um, do mitigation, but at the same time, think about what we can do with the capabilities of satellites and all that's being learned from this technology right now. So I guess for uh, backyard astronomy, it's not a great um, looking like great forecast, but that doesn't mean that we, it's not, it's not important to be looking up at the stars and getting that perspective. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is the new sky. I mean, you know, with, with the, the older we are, the more clear, <laughs> the more empty we remember it, but um, <laughs> You know, there was a time before smartphones, uh, but but now they're part of our our existence. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Uh, a quick question. Maybe this is um, uh, for for Matt again. Um, what percentage of satellites are operated by private versus government organizations? I mean, are, are these are private taking over the skies now, or is it government? Short answer: Yes, private is, uh, but by number for certain. So the number of unique objects has like definitely shot up a ton as a result mm -hmm. of uh, basically two or three mega constellation owners being, you know, um, Starlink, OneWeb, and then um, 
I forget, there's one other that's just started launching. Um, and China also has another one, I think it's called Huawei, that's kind of a similar sort of altitude and uh, arrangement. But um, there's a lot more commercial stuff up there now than military. Um, you know, kind of Cold War era, it was all about not getting nuked. So we built all this kind of complex satellites and radar infrastructure. And now it's much more about talking to each other and taking pictures of the Earth. So by count at the very least, it's definitely way in the favor of commercial. Um, the caveat I'd give is that some of the governmental stuff is huge. Like, you know, like some of the stuff in Leo is, is very insanely big. And I'm sure Frederico could talk more about that. But there's the objects that are all the way out in the geo belt are these uh, monstrous things that a single launch brings up one satellite versus the current commercial launches, which are closer to like 60 to 100. So, yeah, yeah, that, that also makes it how how fast people can populate leo right because before it was first of all the the rate that the satellites were built right because the, the, the big geo satellites they were so complex and so big that they took like years to make something like that and then it was one launch and you get one or two satellites in the launcher because they're really big really heavy and now with the, the changes in technology and how satellites are built now, they are more, almost built in series in some of these, these companies uh, and, and they have the capability, right? Um, shout out to, to SpaceX and the, the reusable rockets, right? This is a, an amazing technology, really. It's mind blowing. And, and they are able to launch 60 satellites at once. And they're also planning on, on new launchers so that we'll be, be able to launch even more satellites at once. So, yeah, technology is advancing a lot. Yeah. Um, I have a question here, and I don't, um, I'm not a ham radio person, so I don't know if this is a, a valid question or not, but uh, um, are LEO satellites being tracked by the WSPR ham network? Oof. I think I heard about that, but I, cannot really say i i i heard that there is an organization of ham uh tracking tracking satellites and receiving signals from satellites and doing some decoding and understanding what the signals are mm -hmm. that's it about what i know um, uh, as matt was saying before it's it's a bit tricky to, yeah. to look at signals from someone else and there, decode them there's one group called the uh sat nogs which does this for sure Sad. And um, I think they're part of, uh, I'll give a shout out to Libra Space, who are pretty awesome people. That's a project of them. Um, then there's also like a bunch of amateur folks that have radar dishes. And, um, you know, you can decode uh, weather satellites because they're, it turns out they're super old. Um, so like the codecs are really well known at this point. So you can pull down data that way if you're really super nerdy. <laughs> I'm just going to, um, before I go back to, to uh, Frederico's last slide, um, uh, to talk about, you know, how maybe to get involved. Um, just a, a shout out. We've got a uh, somebody listening in. Dan is listening in from Germany. So welcome. You should be asleep. Um, we've got uh, uh, people from Sunnyvale, California, New York, Illinois, Michigan, um, San Jose, Santa Cruz. So lots of locals here. Uh, Oakland, Bloomington, um, uh, Minnesota, uh, Tempe, Arizona, Hawaii. Um, Chicago and Brooklyn, New York, to name but a few. Thank you, everyone, for for tuning in uh, to the the show today. Um, uh, Frederica, I'm just going to uh, let you talk a little bit about your last slide. Then I have have one last question to to pose to all of you, um, and uh, then we will wrap up for the evening. So let me see, uh, Frederica, if we can find your slide set again. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, Going to share screen. There okay. Is. All right, good. So I think Simon already mentioned this. Uh, this is, I, I think, one of the the responses from from the astronomical community to this situation. And is that the the International Astronomical Union, the IAU, has created this center for the protection of the dark and quiet sky from satellite pulsation interference, which we call CPS, to make it shorter. Uh, and it's it's basically a virtual center where we try to. Uh, to get together all the different stakeholders or different people interested in this topic, right? And, and this includes everyone. This includes astronomers, amateur astronomers, stargazers, uh, 
people from the satellite companies, uh, people doing space policy, for example. So the, the, the diversity of people in interacting in the CPS is very big. And so this is a call for anyone that is interested in the topic to, to, to sign in, apply for a membership there. You can apply, this is for free. You can just say that you want to know what's going on or you want to actively participate. We have four different areas in the CPS. One is dedicated to policy. So we, we try to understand different national policies. Uh, we try to see how the international uh, aspect of this works and how we can contribute to that. We, we are not a, an advocating group, so we, we don't advocate at any country because we are an international organization, basically, we're an international group. Uh, but we, we try to see what's going on in different countries in terms of policy. There's also the, the SAT hub, which is where most of us interact, which is the, the like we call it the executive arm of the CPS is where observations happen. So this is a very interesting part. We have a Slack space where everyone can post their observations and see, oh, I saw this satellite, I saw the other satellite and so on, which is really cool. And so people is, are working, they're really actively looking at satellites. Also, we are developing software. Uh, this was what Matt was mentioning before. We are trying to develop software for mitigations of, of in, in optical and radio telescopes. And we are also talking to, to operators who are working on reflectivity models of their satellites, because that's also a, a thing. So if, if we can also try to model how the satellites will reflect depending on their attitude, depending on where they're looking at, it will be really good. So we are also working on that in SAT Hub. And then there is Community Engagement Hub, which is intended to have a, a broader discussion about the situation with, with anyone that thinks or have, have an opinion on this and then wants to, to have a discussion and also to, to try to make the communication flow easier, to try to make more educational resources. Um, there, there are people involved even from planetariums or, or stuff like that in, in the community engagement hub. And, and then the last one, but not least, is the industry and technology hub. So in, in that hub, we are trying to get the industry people there. So, so we have people from SpaceX, from OneWeb, from Amazon Kuiper, and we are talking to many other of the operators that are trying to get their constellations in LEO. And the idea is to bring them and put them close to astronomers and try to get the conversation flowing and help them to understand what is the position of the astronomers and how they can do some things to try to mitigate the situation. And also we are trying to get astronomers to understand what is the position of the constellations of industry and, and what is possible and what maybe not, right? So that's where we are. And so I invite anyone interested in this. And by the way, Emma and, and Matt are there and that's where mm -hmm. all this started. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and we'll, we'll post that, that link as well so people can, can follow that. Um, okay, one last question uh, to wrap up before Bill says some final words. And so my, I, my question is, you are standing in front of, of an array of thousands of astronomers and, and satellite industry people and, and heads of state from around the world. Um, very, very briefly, what would you tell them that's important to you to think about moving forward in this whole situation? What, what would you like them to know about your community um, as they go off and make uh, uh, decisions as we move forward to this, this, this new uh, world of, of satellites, um, this new satellite era? I, I don't know who we're going to start. We'll start with Emma. What would what would what would you want to say on behalf of the optical astronomers? <laughs> so I would want to ask all of them to approach the topic with empathy, to think about how we can use this resource that we have in low Earth orbit that has tremendous potential sustainably in a way where we don't allow it to become a, a tragedy of the commons kind of situation. And with an understanding that everybody has different goals and priorities for how to use the space. Um, for astronomers, we don't want a lot of reflectivity. We don't like there's a reason why these constellations are causing a lot of consternation for astronomers. Um, but 
as astronomers, we also have to have empathy for why these satellites are going up in the first place and the good that they're doing in the world. So asking everybody to come to the table with an open mind and willingness to collaborate and work together for a solution that can benefit all of humanity. Thank you. Matthew, you're up at the podium. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Bill mentioned earlier, actually, uh, light bulbs and light bulbs were like such a good idea that we like label them as good ideas now. Right. And like it was probably one of the biggest negative impacts on terrestrial astronomy, though. Right. Just having all this sky and city light. And so like a lot of astronomers come to me and they're like very like almost traumatized. They're like, we're so angry about this. And I'm like, well, I, I get it. But also, like, you can't expect people to give up light bulbs. And, you know, satellites are kind of the next uh, iteration of that in some senses. So, you know, much like light bulbs, I feel like there's ways to mitigate this. I feel like there's ways to compromise. I feel like there's ways to negotiate. And um, I don't think anybody wants to blot out the Milky Way. It's a beautiful thing. But I, by the same token, you have to think about everyone's needs at the same time in this sort of world. So uh, be curious about people's fears, Just be curious about their worries and try to do the best you can. Thank you. Frederico. Right. Difficult to be, to be last. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, I'll start with, with space sustainability, right? We we need to, we as a species, we, we need to be careful on how we use space and try to understand that it's a finite resource, right? And, and we need to think on everyone that can be affected by this, right? Uh, it's, it's not only what we satellites can bring, of course, which are great things, but also some the negative effects that we need to think about. And we need to think about them soon. That's the thing. Because this thing is moving very, very rapidly. And, and that's the challenge here. And particularly for radio astronomy, uh, the radio astronomy is not going to stop because of this, right? That, that needs to be clear. It's not going to stop, but it, it's a challenge. It's a growing challenge. And, and what we are trying to argue for is that radio astronomy is done from very special, special sites on the surface of Earth. And there are many, many reasons why we cannot just take radio telescopes out in space and do exactly the same thing we are doing on Earth. Many reasons we cannot do that yet, maybe in 50 years, perhaps, but not yet. Um, and so we are arguing to, to everyone that's working on this operators trying to protect these radio astronomy sites. And we think that it can be done, uh, but we need to think fast on, on how to make the sustainable use of space. Thank you, Frederico. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Matt. Uh, and over to you, Bill. Great. Thank you all very much. And, and you know, great, great questions. Um, it's interesting. I, I, I will say that, you know, in, in, in summary, um, I, I have to agree with, with Emma that, you know, cooperation and, and empathy um, and mutual understanding of the benefits um, and the challenges of, of both satellites, um, constellations, the, the services they provide and the good they do, and the needs of astronomy, astronomers, even citizens, um, and and you know what what we're all trying to do are are important things to try and balance. Um, sadly, humanity doesn't have a really good track record when it comes to either cooperation or empathy on a global scale. But that's one of the reasons why we do SETI at the SETI Institute because we try to look at things at planetary scale. And you know when you get far enough out into space, borders and political boundaries and disputes all all kind of disappear. But uh, anyway, uh, I want to thank you, Simon and Emma and Federico and Matthew for great and, and dare I say enlightening conversation. And thanks to all of you out there for your wonderful questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but remember that you know an unanswered question is really an opportunity for you to answer the question yourself. Remember, science isn't about providing the answers, but rather it's about asking questions and in, in fact, asking the right questions. Um, so um, anyway, we, we do appreciate all your questions and, and you know we'll, we'll try to get to as many as we can in, in all of these ongoing conversations. Uh, Simon mentioned earlier, we did in fact reach once again a global audience in addition to the various people from all over the United States that Simon mentioned. We had friends from Italy, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Germany, England, Mexico, Scotland, uh, as well as of course the USA and you know a particular nod of the cap to our, our friends in Europe who stayed up into the wee hours, not least Federico himself to, uh, to join us tonight. So a special thanks to all of you. 
Uh, and if I didn't mention your location by state or country, that's because you didn't tell us where you are. So next time, don't be shy. And if you have uh, curious and inquisitive friends in far off lands or states that we didn't mention, let them know about SETI Talks. And let's bring even more people together from across the world in the name of science and curiosity. Before we close tonight's event, just another reminder that SETI Talks is a production of the SETI Institute. We're a nonprofit research and education institution whose mission is to lead humanity's quest to understand the origins and prevalence of life and intelligence in the universe and to share this knowledge with all of you, with the world. Our SETI Talks lecture series is supported in part by donations from the public, from friends of science like all of you. We bring these lectures and other events to you at no cost, but we're very grateful for any and all donations that allow us to continue bringing the stories of extraordinary science and exploration to you. So again, visit us at SETI.org for more information. You can sign up for our monthly science newsletter we call Journey. Make a donation if you're inclined to do that or just peruse our website to learn about the wide ranging and extraordinary work we do every day to answer one of science's most profound questions, are we alone in the universe? Thanks again to all of you for being with us tonight. Thanks to our moderator and tonight's wonderful guests. Also wanna thank, thank uh, Rebecca and Lee, Jasmine, Frank and Beth here at the Institute who make the SETI Talk series possible. All our SETI Talks lectures and panel discussions are on our YouTube channel along with vast amounts of other amazing content. So do take the opportunity to explore uh, the SETI Institute's YouTube channel. In closing, remember that the work we do at the SETI Institute is for all of humankind. Don't just stand by and watch, come and join us at SETI.org and you can get involved. The search for life beyond earth is a journey of ultimate discovery. We invite you to come along and thanks for being with us tonight. We look forward to seeing you next time. Take care.